Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Ann Rankin, uh, Senior Vice President and Provost, and uh, it's my pleasure and great honor to welcome you here this afternoon, and thank you for coming to help us all welcome our newest um, professor of the practice, uh, Michael Kaiser, uh, and the DeVos Institute, which he directs, to the University of Maryland family. So thank you all for being here to help us do that. Um, Michael uh, will be introduced to you in more fully uh, later, but I'm sure in reality he doesn't need an introduction to this audience. In addition to be a local, being a local and national celebrity uh, as the charismatic president of the Kennedy Center for the last 14 years, he's known as the turnaround king for his work in such arts institutions as the Kansas City Ballet, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, American Ballet Theater, the Royal Opera House, and really most recently at the Kennedy Center, uh, the Washington National Opera. He is the world expert in arts management. Um, and it's, it's truly a thrill to have him join the University of Maryland as, as I said, a professor of the practice and as a, a, a real leader in the arts world and part of us. It's, it's really going to take, I think, the University of Maryland to another level in national attention and recognition in this world. So this is, this is really an, a landmark day and, an ex, and a really exciting beginning to a wonderful partnership, I think. Um, the training program for people in this very important field that Michael Kaiser and his partner Brett Egan have developed uh, in partnership with the DeVos Foundation is a strategic, analytical, hands-on approach to the challenges facing arts organizations and actually arts organizations around the world, across the country, but in even the most far-flung parts of the globe, Michael and his group are working. Um, they are working, really, to share his expertise and savvy and insights into what makes for success and solvency, really, in, in the nonprofit arts management world. Um, and I have to say, I've, I served on a couple over the years, a couple of boards of arts um, pr um, programs. Uh, for example, I was on the um, board of the Austin Lyric Opera for a long time in, in Austin and watched as that organization just struggled and struggled to keep its nose above water barely. and and fob off its creditors and stay in the <laughs> place, uh, in the physical uh, uh, space that they were renting and all these things. And I just think, Michael, I want you to go to Austin and save that place because I know they're still, <laughs> they're still in the same mess they were before, even though they produced fabulous operas. I think this is a, a very uh, widespread problem among arts organizations. and. Michael knows how to fix it, and he is fixing it, and helping organizations everywhere fix it. And I think it's incredibly exciting that the University of Maryland is now going to be a part of that. Um, he's written, actually he's written a number of books, but his most recent one, his upcoming book, um, addresses these issues exactly and examines the economics of American arts organizations, and I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, later on as, as Sherry interviews him. I want to say a little bit about how relevant this is to where the University of Maryland is going and the kind of university we want to be. The quality, creativity, and innovation of a society's fine arts are among the primary standards by which that society is judged. And I think that's true of a university as well. The great universities in this country have not only fine science, engineering, uh, and uh, uh, st other STEM programs, medicine, and so on, they are strong in 
in the arts and humanities. Um, and they find ways to make connections between art and design and, and the, the, the sort of the creative side of the, uh, uh, of the uh, world and the technological side of the world, of the university. And it's at these intersections that really paradigms are changed. New, completely new paradigms are developed. New knowledge is created and new opportunities are developed and realized. And as a university, this has become a focus for us, for the University of Maryland. We've had ever-growing strength, I think, in the fine arts. We have a fabulous, we have fabulous programs in dance and theater. Music is amazing here. Uh, the art programs are just terrific. Um, and, it's, and we are emerging, I think, on the national scene as a national force in this area. Uh, we've recently been recognized by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as one of the three national leaders in advancing the conversation about the importance of the arts and humanities to the future of our nation. We're also a founding member of the Alliance for the Arts and Research Universities, which is a partnership of 31 institutions committed to transforming research universities to ensure institutional support for interdisciplinary research curricula programs and more connections between the arts, sciences, and other disciplines. We want to really be at the heart of that. Uh, President Lowe has said repeatedly that we need to expand Maryland's traditional strength in STEM and our STEM vision to include the arts in very specific ways. So he talks about making this, changing us from a STEM university to a STEAM university. And his incredible efforts to create partner, a partnership opportunity with the Corcoran was a great example of that. Nobody could have put more time or energy into a project than he did into that project. It didn't work out, but we learned so much from it, I think about how we could make fabulous, exciting connections between the various parts of campus and, and develop new opportunities. Um, a good example of that is the most recent gift for uh, the new computer science building from the founder of Oculus, who's developed a fortune in virtual reality, which he and uh, his colleagues are saying is going to transform the entertainment industry, visual arts, uh, and, and he wants to help Maryland be right at the heart of that intersection between this extraordinary, extreme technology in computer science and new opportunities in the visual arts and performing arts. Uh, this is just such an exciting time. And bringing Michael Kaiser and the DeVos Institute to the University of Maryland at this critical moment is just a perfect uh, and major step, I think, forward in that effort. Uh, Michael knows everybody in the arts world and I think is also very interested in these same kinds of issues and in helping us really make these fabulous connections that will, will take us to another level. He's going to be a tremendous help, and I hope we're going to be able to help him as well in some of the things he wants to accomplish. Um, so once again, this is a big day. This is a landmark event, and I'm, I'm proud that you're all here. I think we're all going to look back after a number of years and think, hmm, we were here at the start, and this is, this is really wonderful. I'd like to recognize uh, the, some of the university leaders and special guests who are here with us today um, and thank them especially for being here to help uh, show our support for the arts. Uh, I don't know whether President Lowe is here yet. He had a conflict, probably hasn't come yet. He'll, he'll be coming in later, I think. Um, we have a number of deans with us. Deans, Dean Bonnie Thornton Dill, who's over here, of course, since. 
this is her, this is her deal here. Uh, our, our new dean of Vsauce, Greg Ball. Greg, where are you? There he is over there, Greg. Uh, our wonderful dean of business, Alex Trianis, the, the dean of the Smith School. Alex, where are you? He was here earlier. Okay. He gets a check mark next to his name. No. <laughs> And David Cronrath, uh, Dean of Architecture. Uh, Dean, uh, David, where are you? I don't see him either. Okay, he was here earlier as well. We, uh, one of our trustees, Ralph Larry, is here. Ralph, thank you for being here very much. <laughs> our, our Vice President for External Relations, Peter Weiler, is here. Peter, where are you? He's not here either. Okay. Um, uh, we have a special guest, Jeannie Howe, from the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance. Jeannie is right down here in front. Jeannie, thank you for being here. Um, so, once again, uh, thank you all for helping us to welcome Michael. Uh, our students are, are, are some of our most important innovators, as you all know, I'm sure. They are... Uh, smarter than we are, and it's a good thing that we don't have to try to get in here any now because we probably couldn't make it in competition with them. They're just incredible. And they take advantage of all these terrific opportunities to combine science, social sciences, arts, and humanities in creative ways. But I'd like to introduce you to uh, one student who's really taken this to an extraordinary level and, and, um, and in a way that is exactly relevant to what Michael Kaiser is doing with the DeVos Institute. Um, her name is Patricia Mullaney Loss, and she's a fantastic example of a UMD student who combines the, this is, these are, I think, Bonnie's words, somatic intelligence of a dancer, see, that's a new term for me, and uh, with the strategic intelligence of an arts administrator. She will tell you um, a little bit more about her undergraduate journey, but she was a student majoring in dance and government and politics, and then uh, went on to study a for a master's degree in um, public policy, where she, and she's just about to finish that, that master's degree. Um, and her desire as a graduate student to use the arts as a, as a means of cultural diplomacy fits in so beautifully with Michael Kaiser's efforts to enhance arts management capabilities across, across the world, really. Um, Patricia uh, is going to introduce Michael. And uh, Patricia, would you come out? Yes. She's from Minneapolis originally, uh, came to Maryland of about six years ago. Exactly. So Patricia, thank you very much for being our introducer. And uh, please, thank you tell us me. more about yourself. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Patricia Mullaney Loss. Um, I'm, as the provost said, I'm a master's student in the School of Public Policy, but I graduated here in dance and government and politics just in 2013. I'm very honored to introduce Michael Kaiser today, the founder and chairman of the DeVos Institute of Arts Management, as it marks the beginning of a new partnership between the Institute and the University of Maryland. I've been on campus a for a little over five years now, and I've witnessed students at the Clarice and across the campus hone their disciplines and blossom into incredible artists. That has led me to think about who will support them once they leave Maryland. As I, after I graduate, I plan on pursuing a career in cultural diplomacy from both the perspective of a dancer and as a policymaker. I want to practice art that connects people across the globe, and I want to help others do the same through political channels. My experiences at various government and private institutions have shown me that the fields of arts and policy can be isolated if they lack creative leadership. Moreover, it is the artists that tend to suffer when connections are not cultivated between these spheres. I see need for a program that will explore how to manage cultural institutions, artistic endeavors, and creative partnerships in a variety of contexts. For over a decade, the DeVos Institute has been doing just that. 
It has trained and supported arts managers and served over a thousand institutions all over the world. Maryland, which provides a rich array of both local and international resources, will situate the DeVos Institute in a perfect position to instruct the next generation of arts managers and further provide support for arts organizations across the globe. The Institute will attract talented students into this interdisciplinary field that cuts across so many sectors, arts, culture studies, business, government, economics, sociology, technology, to name a few. Indeed, arts administration takes a unique combination of abstract and qualitative work along with concrete and quantitative analysis that I pr find particularly exciting. So, as a soon-to-be alumna, I'm thrilled to know that I'll be able to return to UMD and see the amazing work and talent coming out of this new collaboration. Without further ado, Michael Kaiser founded the DeVos Institute in 2001. From 2001 to 2000, 2014, Kaiser served as president of the Kennedy Center, the nation's center for the performing arts, where he expanded the education and artistic programming, oversaw a major renovation effort of most of the center's theaters, and led the country in arts management training. As the provost said, Kaiser previously served as executive director of the Royal Opera House in the United Kingdom, the American Ballet Theater, the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater Foundation, as well as the general manager of the Kansas City Ballet. Before entering the arts management field, Kaiser was a management consultant in the corporate sector. Kaiser received his master's degree in management from MIT's Sloan School of Management and his bachelor's degree in economics, magna cum laude from Brandeis University. Kaiser has received numerous awards for his contributions, including the George Peabody Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Music in America. Um, he is the author, author of eight books, actually, uh, so many, um, most recently being Curtains, The Future of the Arts in America, which is due out early next year. Lady, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Michael Kaiser to the stage. He's accompanied by Sherry Parks, Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Humanities and Cultural Critic for WYPR Baltimore, who will conduct this conversation. Thank you. First, let's welcome him again to the University of Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we will get to know you properly now. Can we talk first about the young Michael? You were born in New York City? I was born in New York City, and, in the barrio. And then moved to New York State. So everybody I know who's ever worked in the arts or around the art has a story about when they knew, they knew that it was important for them to stay near or in the arts. What's yours? Well, I was four years old, <clears throat> and my parents were planning to take my brother and my sister to see The Music Man on Broadway. And as they talked about it, I just assumed I was going along. I was the youngest. And um, so I got to go. And we, the curtain opens, and it's the most magical musical. It's been done here, I know, at the university. And um, Barbara Cook was playing Marion the Librarian. It was the original production and Robert Preston was the music man. And when, the Mar when Marion the Librarian sings Goodnight My Someone, she's standing on the porch of her home, and the front of the home was made out of a material called scrim, which when you light from behind, you can see through it. And all of a sudden, I could see into the house and see this little girl taking a piano lesson while Barbara Cook was singing Goodnight My Someone. And I said, this is the most magical moment of my life and I will spend my entire life figuring out that curtain and how you could see into the house. And that's exactly what I did. And fast forward then about 50 some odd years later and Barbara Cook worked with me at the Kennedy Center and curated the, and continues to curate the cabaret series there, which I asked her to do. So it was quite remarkable to be able to work with this person who inspired me when I was four years old. But your dad wanted you to be a dentist. My dad wanted me to dentist. He said, you'll always have work if you're a dentist. <laughs> and, and 
I've found another place where you always have work, which is fixing troubled arts organizations. Um, and so my father has given in, and he knows I will not be a dentist. We are at a particular moment in, in the arts in the, in the United States, but there's a story from your early history, as Patricia told us, you started out as a consultant for, for GM and, and other businesses. You told them that they needed to change in order to continue. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I, I had a business of my own, a consulting business for corporate clients um, in the early 1980s. And I worked with a lot of big companies and two of the biggest were IBM and General Motors, both of which were facing, both of which had been incredibly successful, but both of which were facing major changes to their industry. And in both cases, I talked about how I saw their industries evolving and changing. And in both cases, they found me humorous. Um, and they sent me around to all the various offices around the world to make my speech, sort of, I think, to build morale so everyone could laugh at me and they could all feel like they were going to be successful. In the case of IBM, I talked about the fact that the profitability of the hardware was really starting to erode and that they were, that the money and computers was going to be made by, in software and in service. Um, and in the case of General Motors, we talked a lot about the niches that were being formed and how either you were going to be the really low cost producer, which the US car makers were not at the time, or you were going to be able to satisfy these very specialized niches that the European car manufacturers ended up taking over. Um, but they also didn't believe much in that either. So I was very frustrated. Um, I really thought I was right, but they didn't quite believe me. And there's another story about when you decided that you needed to re-enter the arts. You sold your consulting business. I did. Um, they were playing Leontine Price's voice on the, I don't know if you heard her when you came in, but she was being played when I came in. And she was her my, present to him, he didn't know. She's, she's my favorite, favorite, favorite of all time. And um, Leontine Price retired from the Metropolitan Opera. I believe it was January of 1985. She did her last operatic performance. It was a performance of Aida. And I just went through hell to get a ticket because she was my favorite. And I did get a ticket in the orchestra to hear Leontine Price's last performance ever of Aida, her greatest role. And two days before, General Motors called and said, you have to come, there's no option, you have to come to this meeting. And I missed Leontine Price's last performance. So that said to me, this is not going to happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of my management consulting career. <laughs> and now you get to see as much art as you like. And now I can see it when I wanna see it, who I wanna see, and, and it was much, truly that meeting at General Motors was not that important that day. And I would have remembered that performance for the rest of my life, I know. So since you enter or re-enter the arts from the business perspective, can you talk about the difference in mission culture between those two that, that may make your work more novel than it might otherwise be? Sure, there's a lot of similarity between a corporation and an arts organization. There's a need to generate revenue, there's a need to control cost, these are very similar. What's really different are the missions of the organization. I always like to say that in the corporate world, it's really easy to understand the mission. Even though every corporation has a fancy statement in their annual report or on their website, we bring the beauty of transportation to the world or whatever it is, their real mission is in the words for profit. In fact, it's legislated that way. You are, it is illegal if you're a publicly traded company not to make that what you are there for, for profit. In the not-for-profit world, we only know what we're not for. Um, but what are we for? And the joy of working in the not-for-profit sector is that we actually get to say what our mission is, what we're trying to accomplish. It is true that we have to balance our budgets. It's true we can't go bankrupt. But having a little extra cash at the end of the year if our work wasn't as good, if we didn't serve as many people, if our art wasn't wonderful, if we didn't educate the community, then we were not successful. <clears throat> so it's that difference in mission that is so critical. And the hardest part, when one educates board members who come from the corporate sector to sit on the board of an arts organization, or when, like myself, I worked in the corporate sector and then come into the not-for-profit world, 
the hardest part is to truly embrace and appreciate this difference in mission. That is, how we measure success is very different. And if we don't respect that, we're not going to really serve our communities well. There are some challenges inherent to the arts that make it difficult. Um, there's some changes they can't make that you pointed out before. Well, they can't change the size of their audience. Oh, right, yes. Uh, the well, we have two major economic problems in the arts um, that have been with us since the time of the ancient Greeks. The first one is we don't improve worker productivity very well. You know, worker productivity improvement is critical to our economy. We read about it every quarter in the newspaper. Worker productivity went up 2% or 3%. And the reason why it's so important is because work, when workers are more productive, it mitigates the impact of inflation. Inflation's a little less because workers are producing more per hour. In the steel industry or automobile industry or computer industry or banking industry or virtually every industry. But in the arts, we don't improve worker productivity very well. Um, we don't play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony faster every year. Um, there are the same number of dancers in Balanchine Serenatas when he created it in 1934. We don't lose a dancer every year. Um, our worker productivity doesn't improve, and because of that, we suffer from inflation in the arts more than other industries. And so that's one major challenge. The other major challenge is that once we build a theater, like this beautiful theater, the number of seats does not go up every year. Our, our market doesn't go up. So our real earned income, our uninflated income from our ticket sales is constant, the potential. I, I used to run the Alvin Ailey Company, was mentioned before, a wonderful African-American dance company. And I was fortunate enough to bring it to the Herod Atticus, which is this gorgeous amphitheater built into the base of the um, Acropolis in Athens, Greece. It was built by the Romans, actually. And you sit on these stone bleachers, and there's an outdoor platform. And if you ever are in Greece and have a chance to go to a performance there, it's magical because the moon's lit up, the Acropolis is behind your neck, and you see this gorgeous stage, and it's just beautiful. And my dancers were so happy to be there, and I just stood on the stage and said, the exact same number of stone bleachers for 2,000 years, no increase in earned income potential. <laughs> um, and so when you take these two factors of rapid inflation because of lack of productivity and flat real earned income because our seats don't grow, go up every year, we have this gap between expense and income that is really the key challenge in the arts. How do we fill that gap? And we are all struggling to figure out different techniques for filling this gap. And that's the real heart of the arts management challenge which is how do we encourage great art making and great educational work and at the same time fill this gap that has emerged and gets worse every single year between expense and income. And if one does that in a smart way, if, the, if one does that well, then your arts organization is gonna flourish and you're going to be able to continue to make art for a long time to come. But if you fail to do that, that's when we have all the bumps in the road that we read so much about these days in the newspaper. You've suggested that we're at the end of the golden age of, of arts organizations. Can you talk about the art explosion in the 20th century that we're so sure off of? You know, we take accessibility to the arts for granted, but if you went 100 years ago in the United States, there were many, many, many fewer theater companies, dance companies, musical ensembles, museums, um, the 1920s and 30s, there just there were many fewer. Some the big cities would have them, but there were many fewer in towns across America. After World War II, we saw this explosion of interest in the arts, this optimism in America, the the building of middle class, and to be a good citizen meant going to your local cultural institutions and you'd subscribe to your symphony or your theater company, your dance company. And between 1950 and 1990, we built 100,000 arts organizations in America. Every community has them, and we expect them everywhere. We expect to have a choice of theater companies. One theater company is not enough. It used to be Washington had the arena stage. That was it. Some of you are nodding your head. You remember those days. And now we have 70 professional theater companies in the Washington area. And we take this for granted um, as if that's our right. Um, 
And I do worry that we're now seeing a period of time where we're going to actually see many fewer organizations. And I worry about the availability and accessibility of arts to everyday people all across America in the coming 20, 30, 40 years. And, and that is your mission. I mean, that you really, and you mean it, that you, you oh, are yeah. setting out to save as many arts organizations as you possibly can. I'm the Don Quixote of <laughs> arts management. Um, and there's, there's reasons why it's gotten so hard that have to do with changes in demographics and changes in our lifestyles, for example. It used to be that subscription, that 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the seats for a theater company or a symphony were sold by subscription. People had their Thursday night subscription or their Saturday night subscription. But over the last 30 years, that started to decline. I think it declined for two main reasons. One is because of the number of women who started to work outside of the home. Women were the subscribers in the family. They were the ones who organized the subscription. And as more and more women started to work outside the home, it became harder for them to predict that I will be available every second Thursday to go to the symphony. And the second is how much we started to travel for business and how much we travel in general. Um, the funny thing is we have all these technologies now that mean we can sit home and talk to everybody and yet we're still traveling more than ever and flying more than ever, which also makes it hard to subscribe. So we've seen our subscriptions fall. We've seen arts education in our public schools fall. And this has meant a decrease in the demand for the arts from, by many, many people, um, unfortunately. Um, We've seen a lot of competitive products be developed online. There's now so much art that you can see for free. And as our ticket prices have gone up too fast in the arts, it's become very hard to hold on to our audiences. Um, I've just finished a book on this topic, and I looked at the Metropolitan Opera, that in 1960, the center orchestra seats at the Metropolitan Opera were $10. Today, they're $300. That's a 30 times increase from 10 to 300. Inflation in that period has only gone up 7.8 times. So tickets to the Met have gone up four times the rate of inflation to, to fill that gap I was talking about. Unfortunately, what that meant was for a lot of people, the arts became irrelevant. Not that they didn't care about the arts or wouldn't be inspired or enjoy the arts, it just became too expensive. And now we have, over the last 15 years, the development of so much online entertainment from YouTube, where you can listen and watch Leontine Price sing Il Trovatore for free, um, to video games, to Netflix, you know, Angry Birds, you name it, it's out there. And it starts to eat away at our audience. And, and now we're seeing something new, relatively new, which scares me the most, which is, we're seeing a change in the way the arts are being distributed really for the first time since the Greeks, which is online. Um, the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts their performances now to movie theaters live. They're very popular. They're $25 versus $300. One can see why they're popular. Um, and they make the Met an international organization, meaning you can go to the Met broadcasts in Prague, and you can go in London, and you can go in Omaha, and you can go in New York to see these broadcasts. They're wonderful. I believe very shortly those will be on your home computer and home screens and home entertainment systems and not so much through movie theaters. And as we start having, which we already have now, the Bolshoi Ballets distributing online, the National Theatre of London's distributing online, the Royal Shakespeare Theatre Company, as we start to have these very large organizations putting their art online at no or very modest cost to users, and as we have a generation coming up who's used to getting their art on demand when they want it on their screens, I am very concerned that we're going to see not the largest organizations have disappear, although some of them may, and not the smallest organizations who serve at the community level. I'm very concerned for that middle size, the regional theater company, symphony, opera company, that has built a cost infrastructure that was supported by an aging donor base and may not be able to compete with the Metropolitan Opera and the Bolshoi Ballet and the National Theater. And I do see that ahead, and we're already starting to witness, a group of that mid-range organization start to disappear. And this to me is extremely sad because I really do want to see arts organizations thrive and I want to see the accessibility for Young people, old people, every person, I want them to be able to go to the live theater, to go to the live symphony, go to the live opera. 
And so my work is about how do you work with arts organizations to encourage really dramatically interesting programming, because that's one way you compete with online. And the secondly, how do you manage yourself in such an effect effective and efficient way that you have the resources to do this unique and important art. And so I'm really working very hard to try and develop a cadre of healthy arts organizations so that we do have arts accessible across the country. Well, let's dig into that for a minute. Let's do a case study. Um, Alvin Ailey, mm. visionary founder, mm. well-known, excellent dancing, almost bankrupt. Yes, 1991, a year after Alvin died, the company was a week from bankruptcy. If they had gone to bankruptcy court, every judge in the country would have said, fine, you're bankrupt, go goodbye. Um, and it was interesting um, because when I was hired, that was when I was hired to come there, and I was hired, and in the interviews, the board was really confused. They said, we're so famous. Everyone's heard of Alvin Ailey. We perform all over the world. We perform all over America. We're on television. How could we be in so sick? Um, and then shortly after I arrived, the author Alex Haley died. You know Alex Haley is the author of the book Roots. And we got thousands of letters of condolence because people thought Alex Haley was Alvin Ailey. Um, and that told me that even though we were sort of famous, we weren't that famous, you know? People thought we wrote Roots. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of arts organizations. Our names sort of float out there and we think everyone knows what we do. I bet you there are people on this campus who have no idea what the Clarice is. Um, we just think they do, and we think we're doing enough marketing, but we're not. And so what we had to do at, at the Ailey Company was to really start to educate our community about who we were, what we did, and that we didn't write roots. Um, and so I put in place something I call institutional marketing. It's a term I made up at Ailey. Um, different from what I call programmatic marketing. Programmatic marketing is the marketing we do to get people to buy tickets to our performances, to next Thursday's performance of Giselle, or coming to Saturday's performance of Hamlet. That's one field. There's a whole different field called institutional marketing, which is the marketing we do to get people to say, this is such an exciting organization. I can't imagine my life without it. I've got to participate. And at, at Ailey, we put in place a one-year program of institutional marketing. We did the Phil Donahue show. For those of you who are too young, he was the person before Oprah. Um, and we did a whole hour on the Donahue show. And the next month was President Clinton's first inauguration. And we got on their gala performance that was given the night before with Barbara Streisand and Fleetwood Mac and Michael Jackson and all kinds of people and the Ailey Company. And then two months later, we did an exhibition about our history at the Smithsonian here in Washington. And then in July, we did a big free concert in Central Park. And CNN covered it and ran a section on it every half hour for 24 hours. And the next month, the mayor of New York named our street Alvin Ailey Place. And there was a whole bunch of buzz around that. And then in November of that year, two books were published about the organization. One was the autobiography of Judith Jamison, our artistic director. And one was a book of photographs by a man named Jack Mitchell, who'd been photographing the Ailey Company virtually for its entire history. Um, and then in December of that year, exactly a year after Donahue show, was our 35th anniversary season. And we opened with a big gala with Al Jarreau, Dionne Warwick, and Jesse Norman singing Revelations, our big work and a new piece that Judith Jamison created with Anna Devere Smith, and Denzel Washington was a host, and Maya Angelou read a poem. It was an amazing event. Everywhere we looked for that year, there was Ailey doing something vibrant and interesting and special. And in that year, our fundraising doubled. Um, and it doubled because people wanted to join us. They wanted to become part of our family. And so a lot of the work I do is to try and get arts organizations to think about how they can do this institutional marketing, how they can do really exciting art, and then how they can really make their case so in such an interesting, exciting fashion that people want to participate and want to belong. And I find if those two things happen, the arts organizations can regain health. And the great thing in the arts is we can't get that sick because no one lends us very much money. So we're not like major corporations who have hundreds of millions of dollars of debt. We tend to be sick because we're sick by $100,000 or $500,000 or a million dollars. 
And in the case of the Royal Opera House, where I got there $30 million, which is the most I've ever seen. Um, but mostly our deficits are relatively manageable. It's a question of how do we build a lot of excitement and a lot of interest really fast. You also move into the organization, and you have another term that you coined, the cycle, that explains what you do. Right, and the cycle really reflects our Ailey strategy. What our belief is, if you do really exciting art, and I don't just mean like art like everyone else is doing it, but something that's really distinctive and important, and if you do really great marketing, people want to join your family as an audience member or a donor or a volunteer or a board member. And when your family is happy and engaged and growing and feels love for the organization, they produce money. And when that money goes back into exciting programming, which you then market really well, the family gets bigger and happier and more engaged and you get more money. And we have this self-reinforcing cycle that characterizes healthy organizations. The interesting thing is the first thing arts organizations that are facing a challenge tend to cut are artistic initiative and marketing. And so we end up cutting artistic initiative, we end up cutting marketing, our family gets a little less interested. There's lots of competitors out there for our family members, there's lots of other organizations who would love to see them join them, and we lose a few of them, we have less money, so we cut our art a little more, we cut our marketing a little more, and our family gets weaker and thinner and less engaged, and we have less money, and we get sicker and sicker and sicker. Think back to the sad story of the New York City Opera, a great organization, that over time lost its family. And by the time it declared bankruptcy a couple of years ago, there were too few people left to actually care to save them. And so a lot of the work I do is to work with organizations to help them build their families. And, and this is a particular concern of mine for organizations of color, like the Alvin Ailey organization. I do a lot of work with Latino, African American, Asian American, Native American organizations because the initial funders for organizations of color typically were foundations and government agencies. And unfortunately, foundations and government agencies tend to have a cap on how much they'll give. And so organizations of color would hit this top limit and stagnate. And unlike mainstream Caucasian organizations, where the vast majority of money comes from individual donors, over 60% of the money for arts in America come from individual donors. For organizations of color, 6%. <coughs> Big difference. And as a result, we end up with, a, with organizations that don't have the capacity to build their income base. So today, the Ailey organization is the only arts organization of color in America with a budget of more than $10 million, which is a real problem. And so a lot of my work is working with organizations of color. How do, you, how do they build their individual donor bases? How do they do their institutional marketing so that we can start to change the funding pattern so we can have growing, vibrant, healthier organizations of color who are absolutely critical to the arts ecology of this country? You are a strategic person. And so I'm assuming that you have decided to come to the University of Maryland to a research institution at this particular time for a particular reason. Why are you here? <laughs> the resources available at this institution are just sort of mind staggering. I can't believe how much is here, um, how much technology is here, how many smart people are here. Um, there's so much help we need. <laughs> um, my organization is this big, we're 10 people. Um, and we're thrilled by the resources available here, first and foremost. So for example, we're now planning to do a MOOC, um, a massive open online course of arts management through the University of Maryland, which is going to allow us to reach literally hundreds of thousands of people all across the world. We're very excited about that. Um, and then also we really want to start to, all of our work so far has been training practitioners, people in the field, and we would really like to also start working with students and start to train students. So we have a great interest in working with those who want to enter this field and hopefully provide some training and some entree for those who want to be in this field. So for both of those reasons, this is an ideal place to be. We already have several interns who are working with us who, come, who are students here at the university. We're thrilled about that. Um, 
we are excited about this structure, the Clarice. Um, we run fellowship programs for arts managers who come and study with us, and we're going to be housing those fellowship programs here at the Clarice, and this will be a wonderful laboratory for these um, young arts managers to learn. So there's so much here on this campus, and every time I'm here and talk to people and learn about other projects that are going on here, I realize how many points of contact there are and how much opportunity there is. And the only challenge on me is going to be to try and discipline myself to do a few at a time and not to try and do everything because it's such a large campus. Can you talk about your plans for Baltimore? Well, we're very excited that the university is going to help us start an arts management training program in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, we have run these programs in several cities where we work with typically in a city between 20 and 40 arts organizations where we come and teach arts management to those who are running arts organizations and to their board members. Um, we also run online sessions in lots of particular subjects and then we provide mentoring and consulting to each organization that is personal to them. And we've run these programs in several cities and we're really excited that the university is going to help us do a program in Baltimore. That should start early in 2015 and we're having a sort of a first meeting next week in Baltimore. So we're, we're really excited about the possibility of, of, there's so much great culture in the state, so much great culture in Baltimore. So we're really pleased that we're going to be able to offer a program there. Okay, crystal ball time. 25 years from now, what do the arts in America look like? I'm, I believe what they're gonna look like is we're gonna have some very large organizations who are doing great work in theaters and on, they're online and, they're, and their work is known across a broad spectrum of the population and they're in a sense international organizations because the internet doesn't, isn't limited by geography and we'll have great American organizations and great international organizations, those that are doing distinctive work available to us online and in theaters, although I think ticket prices are gonna to continue to go up and they're gonna be extremely expensive. And I think we're going to have a group of community organizations and young organizations that give everyone a chance who wants to exercise their creativity a chance to do so. And I think we're gonna have young organizations that give younger people and great visionary young people a chance to create wonderful art. And I think we're gonna have less, much less in the middle. I think we're gonna have an awful lot of opportunities at home to be creative. Um, creativity is never going away, and the arts are never going away. It's a question of the institutional format um, that supports the arts, and I believe there'll be an awful lot of opportunities for all of us to compose at home, to conduct orchestras in our computers, to curate exhibitions at home. I think they're gonna be holograms. I think we're gonna have the Venus de Milo sitting in the middle of our living room. Um, I think there's gonna be a tremendous amount of opportunities to be creative, but I think the institutions that have been organized in the, 19th, in the 20th century primarily to support the arts, I think they're gonna be fewer and farther between. And while that gives an awful lot of opportunities to everyone to be creative, and I think that's wonderful, I will mourn the loss of some of these organizations that these institutions that currently support the arts, that currently create art, because I believe that there is a value, first of all, to ensemble in many art forms. You would not want to see a performance of Swan Lake that was danced by dancers who'd only gotten together three days before. Um, and also, I believe a well-run institution has the ability to create this family of supporters and to keep them in the fold and to keep them, in, keep them giving, keep them involved, keep them engaged. And I worry that when we lose some of these institutions, we're going to lose the capacity to engage people as easily as we have now. So I think that's going to be, I think, a big change that we're going to see. All right. We're coming to the end of this section, so um, think of your questions, because we're going to have some time for question and answer. I want to end on a more personal note to circle back around. You had a wedding last I did. year. And it was historic. It was. Can you talk about that? Yes, I was, the f I was part of the couple. That was the first same-sex couple to be you married. You still are. I still am part of the couple. <laughs> John, it's here. Um, um, to be married by a Supreme Court justice. We were married by Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, on August 31st of 2013. 
And um, it was meant to be a nice, quiet, private ceremony. And then someone in the press found out about it. And it was the most, I've never known what it meant to go viral, but now I know what it is to be in the middle of that. Um, and it was quite astonishing. But um, to be honest, the only thing that really matters about that day is John, not anything else. Aww. <laughs> Okay, if you have been with us for the Dean's Lecture Series, you know that, that there are rules to this question and answer bit. So there, there are two mics, and you must, because we are recording, you must get to the mic unless you are truly disabled, and they will get the mic to you. Um, and the other rule is that you are asking a question. You're not making a speech. And it is, <laughs> it is my job to make sure that that happens. And so the old professor you know, bit will come out. So um, if you have a question, please start making your, your way to the mics. One of the things that, to give you a break, one of the things that I discovered um, while reading is that the, the Clarice is actually financed in part on the European system, that our student fees, some of them come directly to the Clarice system. And so that we are, I knew this part, that we are very unusual because on most campuses, ticket sales drive much more than they do here. What I didn't know was that, I mean, I knew that there was subsidy in, in Europe, but I didn't know that, that it was that specific. So yeah, we are Yeah, there's a lot of subsidy in Europe. Unfortunately, it's starting to evaporate and it's causing great challenge to the arts organizations in Europe, which is why we do as much work in Europe as we do and South America and Africa and Asia. Yes. I'm curious who pays an arts management consultant who is consulting for an organization that is almost bankrupt? It's a great question. Um, sometimes we're not paid, <laughs> um, so we do a lot of pro bono work. Um, most of our fees are paid for by foundations um, to work with organizations they care about. Um, we get a lot of funding from the Ford Foundation, from the Kresge Foundation, from Bloomberg Philanthropies, from the Knight Foundation, and I can go on and on and on. Um, and these foundations fund the tr teaching work we do in many cases, and in many cases they fund the consulting work as well. Um, so, but I have to say when people call us up in need, we never say, where's the money, we're not coming otherwise. <laughs> um, it's just not the nature of the work we do. And you know, we really are committed to, to a healthier arts ecology, and so sometimes we're just not paid. If you were 18 and interested in the arts right now, what would you do? It depends where your talents and okay. skills lie. Let's if you're, assume opera singer, because you, you I was an opera yes. singer, I was, but I was so bad. If you're a bad <laughs> opera singer, like I was, as I was, I would suggest you become an arts manager. It's a great field. <laughs> um, it's creative. You have, it's just as creative, I think, as being the singer or the dancer or the choreographer. Um, and there's a real career path now. There wasn't when I started. When I got out of college, my undergraduate thesis at Brandeis University was an economics thesis on why opera companies should share productions. They didn't back then, and they do now, but I suggested they should. And I gave an economic argument, and, and um, I looked for a job as an arts manager, and there was no career called arts management, and, but now there is, and, and it's a really interesting, fulfilling, great work. So I would say if you're not going to have a career as a performer, this is a wonderful, wonderful kind of career to have. Or you could be like Patricia, and because Patricia, did you say this that you, after you finish your master's, you will return to dance for a while? But she is talented, and I didn't. That was, <laughs> you know, there's a big difference. Everyone is happy I didn't have my career as a singer, particularly my parents, yeah. who have but, heard me too many times. But your husband <laughs> is. Your husband is. No, no, he's an he economist. Sing? Okay, he's an right. economist. Yeah. Hi there. Um, in the future with the university, how does this tie into the academic degrees and certificates um, that the university awards in arts management? We're hopeful that we will be able to create a master's degree program here at the university in arts management um, and participate in that development. That will involve a lot of people on this 
university campus, um, but we would like to play a role in that. Our, our goal would be to create a, a, uh, a program that is extremely practically oriented. Um, to my way of thinking, arts management is a practical field. It's like medicine. Um, I always say, you wouldn't want me operating on you and taking out your appendix if I only read a book, and I don't want you running my ballet company if you only read a book. Um, so I would like to create a program that is very practically oriented, and we've been entering into discussions with various people on the campus already about the possibility of doing that, and, and that's our hope, um, to do that first. Um, so I think that's in terms of coursework, I think that's really where our, our focus is at the moment. I'm going to call on the provost next. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. That's okay. Well, she sees to you. When you're going into an arts organization, particularly one that's in trouble, how do you establish trust? It's a really great question. Have you worked in an arts organization? Yeah, that's why you asked that question. Um, <laughs> What I find is when organizations are really in trouble, everyone knows it, and people are sort of tense and sad and frustrated and angry, and a lot of times there's wars between the board and the staff or between some of the staff and the artists. And, and you know, my message is a message of hope, really, um, which didn't play so well in the election, but I hope works better in the arts. Um, but. My, my message is one not of cutting. You know, a lot of people expect me to come in as someone who does turnarounds and say, cut this, save money, cut this, cut that. Whereas I come and say, what can we do that's amazing? And when you go into a group of artists and arts managers and say, we got to do some really more special stuff, no matter how sick we are, let's think of some really special things, that creates a feeling of excitement and optimism and people start to say, hmm, he's just not here to fire lots of people and save lots of money. I'm not an efficiency expert. What makes success in the arts is exciting programming, is really exciting art, well marketed. That's what creates success in the arts. And that's my message. And so when I come, when I got to American Ballet Theater, and we were so bankrupt at ABT, we had to turn out every second light bulb because we couldn't afford to replace the bulbs and we couldn't afford the electricity. Um, and every day we'd collect the Xerox paper we used that day, we'd turn it upside down and use the other side the next day. Um, that's how sick we were. And I came in and said, we're going to do the biggest project in our history, a full-length ballet based on Shakespeare's Othello, new choreography, commissioned music, new sets, new costumes. And everyone thought I was insane. You know, how can you suggest this when you're bankrupt? And the truth was, I announced it. We announced it for three years out. We didn't do it that year, but we planned it. And just announcing that got people going, hmm, ABT's going somewhere. It's got something exciting. And that starts to change the way people feel. So I feel the way you build trust is to really put the focus back on the mission of the organization which is about art making and education, and, getting, and start to get people thinking what could be amazing that we could do. And I find that's the, that starts to build a trust that maybe I'm not so evil. Yes. Michael, I think this is so exciting. As you were talking about institutional marketing and just exactly what you've just said as well, we could do this for the University of Maryland as a whole. I would, I, I yeah, believe my question is, first of all, would you help us? And secondly, <laughs> what, what, what would you do? What would you suggest? <laughs> I, I, I do believe that the cycle that I talk about is not just about the arts, it's about all not-for-profit organizations. Yeah. I once did a talk sort of like this in a church. It happened to be in a church. It was for the DC Arts and Humanities Council. And the minister sat in the congregation as I was giving my talk. And she wrote me a letter afterwards showing how she was applying the cycle to now running her church. Um, I don't believe this is art specific. I believe it's not for profit specific. So yes, I believe it belongs with universities. The challenge with the University of Maryland is it's so huge and you do so much. I mean, every time I come here, I'm sort of overwhelmed by these waves of what happens on this campus. That selecting what you're going to pick to publicize, how you're going to build that that institutional image is a real challenge in an institution this broad and this deep. Um, but could it happen here? Absolutely. Am I smart enough to do it? Probably not, but I know it, it could be done. Um, and it's already being done. Look how well this institution is doing. 
Look at some of the major gifts you're receiving. Look at the new donors you're getting. You've built an amazing fundraising capacity in a relatively short amount of time. And, and I think that comes from the fact that you've been building your institutional family. And so I'm very excited to be a, just you know, a tiny little piece of that. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm a recent alum of the University of Maryland. And I'm super jealous of the opportunities that all the students are going to be getting as I am just leaving. Um, but my question for you is, as an emerging arts manager that's just starting out her career in the field, um, what do I really need to know about the future of the arts? Specifically, I'm um, incredibly interested in the digital evolution that's happening for that's arts great. marketing. So. Well, the first thing I'd say is anyone who's entering into arts management, find a mentor. Um, it's really helpful. It's really important. We're in a weird field. You know, it's not like a legal field or the medical field where it's such a huge infrastructure where everywhere you go, there are people who are going to guide you along the way. In arts management, that's not true. So I would really recommend that you find a mentor. Come be an intern for us. We'd love to have you. Um, but I think in terms of digital, you know, this is a whole new world. And so I once had a professor in the economics, in economics, because my study was one in economics, and I had a professor named Ann Carter, and she was very wise and she taught me a ton. And she said to me, you have to learn how to trust your own judgment and your own imagination. And I would say, particularly if you're entering into the digital arts field, which is a field in which we have very few mentors, you're going to create it. Your generation is going to create it, not mine. Just trust your judgment. Trust yourself. Be creative. Be daring. And then support yourself with thoughtful infrastructure so that you can do your work. That's what I would say. Yes. I would just ask where you see the growth in the arts industry if you see all these mid-range institutions um, slowly like dying out over the next 25 years where do you see the growth i think we're going to have some very large institutions who get very large because they're serving a very broad community particularly online and i think we're going to have a lot what i see in, and it's already happening is a lot of projects a lot of younger artists it's a wonderful change we've seen and a challenging change we've seen where a lot of younger artists don't want to ally themselves with an institution, but they're getting a group of compatriots together, creating something amazing, breaking apart, and doing the next project with another agglomeration of artists and collaborators. The great thing about this kind of work is how flexible one can be and one's not in sort of this calcified institutional format that often happens in lots of institutions, including arts institutions. The challenge is, how do you build a family that stays with you? If you do this great project and then you break apart and start another one over here, how do you recreate your family without having all the energy and effort of doing so? And I think that's going to be the big challenge. I think a lot of the growth is going to be online. It's going to be a lot of art making that I can't even imagine because it's new um, and I'm not an artist myself. And I think there's going to be a lot of growth with online work. And I think your generation is going to create a whole new art world, and we're going to learn from it. My concern is that we don't, at the same time as all this wonderful new work is created, is that we don't lose some of the classical work, which I think is ageless and timeless, and doesn't speak just to one generation or another, but does cost an awful lot to produce. But then my follow-up question would be, where is the role of the arts managers and the arts administrators that you're trying to train if there is less focus on the institutions and more on these individual I jobs? think, I don't think the middle is going to disappear entirely, part one. So I'm, I'm hoping the well-trained arts managers are the ones to take whatever size organization and let it thrive by allowing it to create unique art. So I'm not saying the whole middle is disappearing. I think there's going to be fewer because there are a lot of organizations who aren't being well-managed. So I'm hopeful that the arts managers we're training are going to A, help the very biggest ones, B, help the smallest ones get off the ground, and C, help those wonderful mid-sized organizations thrive. You know, there are a lot of great mid-sized organizations. Um, the, the Opera Company of St. Louis has just comes to mind, is a wonderfully innovative opera company. It's reviewed every year. Every production is reviewed every year by the New York Times. They go to St. Louis to review it. Why? Because they do such interesting work and they've been doing it for decades. Um, if that organization maintains good management, it's not going to care who else is out there. It does such interesting and important work. 
And that's the real challenge for arts managers. You know, a lot of times we're trained to worry about the fundraising and the marketing and the board development and all that stuff. And my real interest is also how do we really support and encourage our artists to be as wonderful and as innovative as they can be. And what concerns me about the current environment is that the creativity has been beaten out of a lot of us who work in arts organizations because we're so frightened about money that we're looking for what, what are other people doing that are selling? How do we do what others are doing? Or let's all do Carmen because Carmen's popular. Um, and it's that mentality that I think is going to get us sicker. So I'm hopeful the growth and all the jobs of all the great arts managers are going to be in keeping a whole host of organizations really vibrant. You also suggest that the arts manager may not be quite as local, that people in Atlanta don't care that the same show has been done, new show has been done in Portland, and so that you might have somebody who's working with both organizations. You might, and I also believe you're going to have some organizations that really become transnational, particularly in terms of the way they do their marketing, their fundraising. When the Metropolitan Opera gets not just into movie theaters, but gets into homes all over the world, they're going to have a fundraising opportunity all over the world. And so I think there's going to be some ro roles and jobs that create these mega organizations um, who are visible, not unlike television networks are today. And I believe we're going to have the capacity in our homes to say, do we want to watch the Bolshoi Ballet tonight? No, let's see ABT. No, I'd rather see Alvin Ailey. We're going to have these kinds of choices. And I think there are going to be managers who are taking advantage mm -hmm. of that visibility and making it affordable for these organizations to produce so much. Yes. Hello, Michael. So as you know, we're live streaming this, and we actually got a question online from Great. one of the viewers. Um, how important are metrics when talking about economic impact of arts activities? I think metrics are really important when you talk about the economic, if we're really talking about economic impact, I think they're very important in terms of communication with elected officials and with, with major investors in new art centers and new projects. But I don't think we can justify the arts simply on economic grounds. I don't think we should. I don't think we should be forced to. I think the contributions we make to our communities, the contributions we make to the education of children, go beyond simply economic metrics. You know, we live in a creative economy. We need to train our children to be creative thinkers. Who's better to do that than those of us in the arts? To help to exercise and help children exercise those muscles and to really exercise their willingness to try and create something new rather than just to learn by rote. We play a very important role that way. We play a very important role in freedom of expression and a very important role in the creating, creation of healthy society you know, when you look at totalitarian societies, the first thing the totalitarian leadership does is to shut down the arts and the expression of ideas because they know that people want to express themselves, they want to reflect on themselves, and they know that free society grows and prospers when people are expressing what they see and what they feel and allowing for argument and allowing for discussion. And I think we play an important role that way. There's much we do in the arts that can't be measured by an economic metric, which doesn't mean it's not also important to say that when governments, for example, invest in the arts, they tend to get seven tax dollars back for every tax dollar they invest in the arts. It's a very good investment. And so there are metrics for economic development that I think are worth studying, worth discussing, but I don't think they should dominate the discussion. And you say that arts organizations are already the most efficient organizations in the world. We are. You know, a lot of times board members come onto a board saying they do this wrong or they're wasting money here. And we have an impression, Hollywood created this impression of the, you know, the spendthrift artistic director who's running around changing costumes and sets and making all these crazy decisions on the spur of the moment. And yet when you look at how much we accomplish with so little money, look how famous arts organizations get with marketing budgets that are less than the amount of money a major corporation spends on parties every year. And yet we've heard of La Scala, and we've heard of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and we've heard of Alvin Ailey, and we've heard of the Baltimore Symphony, and, and these are great institutions that have marketing budgets that are this big. We are very efficient with our resource. We don't waste money. It does not mean we have enough, but we don't waste it. And to say that we're going to save our way to health almost never works. To say that the way we're going to get healthy is to get le spend less 
almost never works in the arts. When we spend less, our art suffers, our marketing suffers, our families start to dissipate, and our resource base goes away. And every troubled organization that gets really, really sick has a history of cutting back on its art and cutting it back on its marketing, and that spurred the decline of the organization. I was wondering if you would speak more about the education of the arts and how you feel that might affect the world of arts organizations in the future. For, for public school children, you mean education or what? what? I would say just an, sort of an overall what you're seeing in trends in arts, edu right. arts education, if that will affect. We've lost so much arts education. It used to be that we had a sociological trend in this country. You were brought into the arts by your school and hopefully also by your families. You participated in the arts. I'm talking here not about the great arts enthusiasts. I'm talking about more everyday people would participate in the arts until they hit high school. Then they start dating, and they start thinking maybe about college or family or career. And between the ages of 15 and 50, when one tends to have much less discretionary time and discretionary money, a lot of, people's re a lot of people reduce their arts participation. And then, when their children leave the home, when their careers are doing better, they tend to come back into the arts if they had them as children. And they tend to subscribe to their local theater company or become a volunteer or join a board or become a donor. And that's why audiences always look older. You can read accounts from the 1890s for symphony orchestras saying the symphony orchestra world is doomed. Everyone's old in the audience. It's going to die out by 1910. Um, and we know, obviously, that didn't happen because we kept replenishing with more people whose children left the home and they came back into the arts. My big concern is we now have the first generation of 20-year-olds, many of whom have not had a great arts education. There is a group who are arts passionate. They're in it. They know it. And they always argue with me when I say this sentence because they say, well, I love the arts, and I know there's a group of really well-trained, really knowledgeable, amazing young people who will love the arts forever. But there's a, lot, there's a larger group that hasn't had any arts education. And so they're now 20. Pretty soon they're going to become parents. What's going to happen when they become the 50-year-olds? Are they going to come into the arts when their children leave the home? I worry about that. Um, we also are starting to see as our donor base ages and as some families turn the giving decisions over to their children, we're seeing some children who are less interested in giving to the arts than giving to other social causes. All of this causes me concern. And it causes me concern in part because of the health of the arts themselves, but it also gives me concern because I don't think we're training our children to be effective participants in our society if we don't train them to be creative. And I think that this is a very serious issue for the educational system in this country and in many countries, that if we don't train our children to be creative thinkers, they are not going to be as successful in whatever field they choose. And this particularly concerns me when we talk about income gap and the difference between the wealthy and the not so wealthy in this country getting wider. This concerns me true too because the public schools don't train our less wealthy children to exercise their creative muscles. I do worry about how successful they're going to be when they leave school. And so I think there's an awful lot of rationale for us to really be rethinking the notion that STEM is it all and that we don't need STEAM, um, that we don't need that arts within that matrix. We do need them. And I applaud Wallace Lowe and this university for recognizing that and for the emphasis that's been, that has been given to the arts on this campus, I think, for exactly that reason. And there's some very hard evidence to back up what you said about the other oh. skills that participation in the arts generates. Absolutely. In, in fact, there's test scores. It's so funny because we're so test score motivated, and yet we have participated when I was running the Kennedy Center and we created quite large arts education programs. We were participated in large third-party tests that showed that the students who were participating in arts education and in good arts programming, comprehensive arts programming, had far higher reading scores, far higher math scores. There's the things we're, we seem to worship, which are these test scores these days, they were going up because the students 
had a better f way of thinking. They thought better, and therefore they could perform better on these exams. So for lots of reasons, I think we're being very short-sighted if we think of arts education as a luxury. Yes. Hi, my name is Amanda Barber. I'm a current employee of the Clarice, and I actually got my bachelor's in arts management at the University of Tulsa in Oklahoma. Fantastic. So I definitely owe some thanks to you for starting that path. Um, but to the question, um, I did, I wanted, going on that message of hope, I'd love to hear, um, how, do you have a recent case study about a mid-sized arts organization kind of turning things around, going back to the cycle you've um, talked about, and specifically, if you're able to put this as an example, were they able to use any of the current social media and accessibility to part of that turnaround in their story? Absolutely. Um, I have too many to name, but I'll name one that comes to mind. The Miami City Ballet, because um, you said you're from Tulsa, which has a wonderful ballet company. Um, and so Miami City Ballet, a wonderful ballet company founded by Edward, founded by Edward Villela, great, great dancer, um, and now run by the wonderful Lourdes Lopez. And they were having very big financial challenges, and I've worked with them for a few years. And we were able to, with Lourdes, who's, who's a former New York City Ballet dancer as well, um, to create some really exciting programming, to do some really strong marketing, including a lot of use of social media. Um, and I'm a big believer in using social media. Um, I have a hard time with Twitter because I can't say anything in 140 characters, as you can tell. Um, but, but a lot of social media use um, to really energize the Miami community, to raise a lot more money, um, to pay off their deficits, to build an endowment, and the Miami City Ballet is really doing incredibly well. It's one of America's great, great, great ballet companies, and they've really embraced the cycle and have been working at each piece, including an awful lot of social, social media. I, I'm a big believer. The great thing about technology, you know, I talk about some of the challenges of technology. There's great things. We can market the arts now so much less expensively and with so much more information than we used to be able to do. When I started in this field 30 years ago, we would take little ads in our newspaper, we'd have a few brochures, we'd have sell out postcards, and we'd have posters. Well, none of that really allowed us to tell them very much about the art, and it made producing particularly new art very difficult. How could you explain a new ballet or a new opera or a new play if all you have is a little ad in a newspaper or a poster? You couldn't explain it. But now we have online technology. We can have videos and audio, and we can have discussions of the creators, and we can show clips from the past work, and we can do so much. And it's one of the reasons I believe we have so much new opera, for example, these days, that companies are willing to invest in new operas where we weren't willing to 30 years ago because we really can promote them in a different way. And through social media, we can get to so many people and we can create a viral impact of our art. To me, this is cr absolutely critical in the wonderful use of technology for the arts. Thank you. You've used a term a couple of times now, family, which may seem self-evident, but it really isn't. And maybe it's related back to the provost question because you compare it to a sport, the arts to a sports team. I do. Um, when you think about my cycle, and you think about my concept of family, I always say this, and I, I typically get booed by the arts audiences, but, but sports teams have done the best job of embracing that cycle. They create a really exciting product. They market the product to death, particularly institutional marketing. They talk much less about next Thursday's game than they talk about the Ravens, right? They build this family of people who care about them with passion, and that family generates tons of revenue with which they buy better players, market them even more, build a family, get more money. And that cycle, absolutely sports teams do an unbelievably good job of building this family. And I believe arts organizations have assumed that everyone who comes to see them is somehow family, but I don't think we embrace them enough. I don't think we share enough. I don't think we talk to them enough. I don't think we really make them feel like they're part of our organization enough. And so a lot of the work I do is person by person, welcoming them in, talking about the work, giving them some information, letting them feel part of the family. And I use that term advisedly because I believe if we really create a sense of family, we are going to be healthy. The family becomes the foundation that supports us going forward. 
And related to social media, you talk to your family more than you talk to your audience. Absolutely right. And social media gives us a tool that's very inexpensive to talk to those who care about us, who come on our Facebook page, who become our friends on our Facebook pages. We can share so much information. We can get their comments back. We can enter into a dialogue that way that we couldn't in the past without these tools. Yes. You had mentioned that your team currently is about 10 strong. And as you join into the resources of the university here, and possibly it sounds like even the university system schools, how do you see your own team changing over the next few years, five years, 10 years? I'm hoping we'll be able to grow some, but I'm hoping we can also lever off of the great expertise on the campus so that really what we embrace as family, many more on the campus who can part play a role with us, and who find it interesting what we do or find that they can contribute some way or find it enjoyable to contribute in some way. So we're hopeful to use resources on the campus, but also I do believe that our staff is gonna have to grow. Um, you know, we've been at the university for two months um, and the explosion in interest in these two months has really dazzled us and shocked us and scared us a little. Um, so we're now thinking about our hiring plans and how do we create a larger cadre of those who can do the work we do. The challenge is we believe that whoever's gonna teach arts management needs to have a real knowledge of arts organizations. And so what we're trying to do is find those who have the knowledge of a field, the knowledge, the knowledge of the arts, the knowledge of a particular technical expertise or functional expertise and have the joy of teaching it. And so we're looking for those people right now. So anyone who has any ideas, please let me know. Thank, Thank you. you. Any last questions? We've had you work very, very hard this evening. No, not at all. Uh, so join me in thanking Mr. Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there will be a reception out in the Grand Pavilion, and you are all welcome. Thank you. Thanks, all.